My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm seated in the ruins of the ancient city of Philadelphia. It's kind of hard to believe this is ancient Philadelphia because today it's hidden under the buildings of a modern Turkish city. But this really is where ancient Philadelphia was. Philadelphia was established two centuries before Christ by the Pergamene king, Eumenes II. He really loved his brother, Attalus. He loved his brother so much that he decided to build this city and call it Philadelphia, which means the city of brotherly love in commemoration of the deep love he had for his brother. This was an important city because it was a border town. It sat on the border of Mysia, Lydia, and Phrygia. And it was believed that this city had a special mission. Their goal was to export Greek culture and the Greek language to the surrounding areas. You could say that Philadelphia was the open door into those regions. And that's important when you read what Christ said to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter three. He said, see, I've set before you an open door. That was also the testimony of the city. The city had an open door into other regions. And likewise, the church here had a goal the church had a mission to take the culture of the church and the message of Jesus into the surrounding areas. This city was so fabulous that Strabo, the ancient historian, said it was Little Athens. But there was a lot of volcanic activity here. In fact, so much volcanic activity that in the year 17 AD, the city was decimated by an earthquake. The emperor Tiberius rebuilt it, but the people were afraid to live in the city. They were concerned that during another earthquake, structures would fall on them and they would die. So people lived outside the city, but the inside of the city was just magnificent. All of this occurred right here where I am today. This is the ancient city of Philadelphia. And Jesus spoke to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter three and gave them a message that is still pertinent for me and for you today. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Welcome to today's program. I am so glad to be with you today. I've just been waiting to get back in this chair and to sit down and study the Bible with you. And that is what we're going to do today. But first, I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we are here for you right now. Just call us, send us an email, let us know how to pray for you. We're waiting to hear from you so we can put our faith together with you for whatever you're facing in your life right now. And I want to tell you that I'm offering you my series right now, starting today, called Christ's Message to Philadelphia. It's five parts. It comes in multiple formats. It covers everything that we're going to be seeing this week in our programs, all the points, all the principles, all the Greek words, a lot of history. It will really make this message to Philadelphia come alive for you. By the way, what Christ said to them, he's still saying to you and to me, we need to hear what he had to say. It's very powerful. By the way, we're also offering you my book called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy and Today Only. This book is free. It is our gift to you. So if you'll call us or send us an email, contact us right now. We'll get it right in the mail to you. And by the way, it is a serious book. Look at this. It's a big book. It's endorsed by many Christian leaders. It really deals with difficult issues that a lot of pastors don't even know how to address. How do we deal with transgenderism that seems to be confronting us on every side? We don't want to sound like bigots. We don't want to sound like we're narrow-minded. So how do we respond to that kind of nonsense? How do we answer people who really don't know what is right and what is wrong? We need to know how to keep our head on straight in a world gone crazy and to be able to help those who are around us. So this book is our gift to you today only. And I want to tell you that for those who become partners with our ministry, we always send them a gift. We're very grateful for anybody who becomes a partner. And when you become a partner with our ministry, you're helping us pay for the program and take teaching you can trust, not only to you, but to people all around the world. You know, a car is a wonderful thing, but a car doesn't work unless you put fuel in the tank. Our ministry is like a car. We're ready to go. We've worked on our machinery. 
We've worked on our teaching. We've done our part, but fuel has to be put in the tank so that we can take this message to people. And when you give to our ministry, you are literally putting fuel in the tank that empowers us to broadcast the teaching to people all over the world. And I want to say thank you to you for being a partner. And if you're not a partner, please pray about becoming a partner today. And by the way, when somebody becomes a partner, we send them my book, Life in the Combat Zone, which is dedicated to the partners of our ministry. And we also send them Denise's little book, but a powerful book called The Gift of Forgiveness. So when you become a partner, we will immediately send these books to you to initiate our relationship with you as a partner. But today we're going to be looking at Christ's message to Philadelphia. I have my Bible and today we're going to dig deep into Revelation chapter 3. So open your Bible to Revelation chapter 3. I've got my notes because today we have a lot to cover in a very short period of time. But when we come to Christ's message to Philadelphia, he speaks to them about having an open door. And I want to tell you, there is an open door in front of you. You just have to know how to recognize the open door that Christ has set in front of you. And that's what we're going to see as we study Jesus' words to the pastor and to the church in Philadelphia. So let's begin in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7. And in verse 7, Jesus is speaking to the angel of the church, and he says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, and he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Verse 8, I know thy works, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. Then he adds, For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Verse 10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. And finally, in verse 13, Jesus says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. That is the entire message that was Jesus spoke to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. But let's go back to verse 7 and begin at the beginning. And in verse 7, Jesus says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. In this verse, we find that Jesus speaks to the angel of the church. The word angel and the word church are both very, very important. And we find that Jesus addresses every single message in the book of Revelation always to the angel of the church. We see this in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 when Jesus speaks to the angel of the church of the church in Ephesus. We see this in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 8. When Jesus speaks to the angel of the church in Smyrna, we see this in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 12. When Jesus speaks to the angel of the church in Pergamum, or how about Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18. When Jesus speaks to the angel of the church in in Thyatira, or Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, where Jesus speaks to the angel of the church in Sardis. Now we're seeing in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 7, Jesus speaks to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And we're going to see in the future that Jesus also speaks in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14 to the angel of the church in Laodicea. In all seven cases, Jesus speaks to the angel of of the church. He does not speak directly to the church. He speaks to the angel of the church. And some people wrongly suppose this means there is really an angel over every church. But in fact, this word angel is the Greek word angelos, and I want to cover this for you again today. The word angelos is a Greek word which describes a human messenger or an angel. It is one sent on a special mission, one dispatched to perform a specific assignment, a delegate or a dignitary. 
It pictures the role of a pastor who is the messenger of God. According to the usage of this Greek word angelos, here translated as angel, your pastor has been dispatched from heaven on a specific assignment to lead your church. Your pastor is a heavenly dignitary. He is a delegate sent from God. He is the mouthpiece of God to deliver God's word to your congregation. And you need to really pray for your pastor. Pray for your pastor to have ears to hear what God has to say to the church. Because when God has a corrective word to speak to any church, he speaks it to the pastor first. God never bypasses spiritual authority. If God has set someone in authority over the church, God's going to speak to that person first. And in the case of the local church, that would be the pastor. And that's why in all seven of these cases, Jesus does not directly address the church, but he speaks to the angel of the church, the pastor. And it is the pastor's responsibility to hear what Jesus has to say, to digest it, to take it into his system, to get all the nutrients out of it that he can get out of it, and then to preach it, to teach it, and to pass it on to the church in the power and in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That is the job of the pastor. And in fact, that is the foremost job of the pastor. And by the way, there are many other reasons why a pastor is called an angel. I cover a lot of this in my book called A Light in Darkness. If you don't have A Light in Darkness, that's a book you need to add to your library. It is powerful. It's huge. It's full color. It deals with Christ's message to Ephesus and to Smyrna. It is just packed full of revelation. But in that book, I deal with this word angel and why the word angel was used to describe the pastor of the church. But notice again in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7, it says to the angel of the church. Well, now let's come to the word church. The word church, as we have seen in all previous cases, when Jesus spoke to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, now he's speaking to Philadelphia. In all seven cases, he speaks to the angel of the church. What is the church? Well, the word church is one of the most profound revelations in the whole New Testament. You have to always remember that when the New Testament was being birthed and Christianity was coming about, there was no Christian vocabulary. So the writers of the New Testament had to borrow words from other sources to create a Christian vocabulary. And the word church was not originally a Christian word. It was a pagan word. And most importantly, it was a very political word. The very fact that they would use this word church meant they were placing themselves in jeopardy because Roman authorities would have hated the usage of this word church. It was a political term. Where did they get it? The word church is the Greek word ekklesia. It's a compound of two words. The word ek means out. The word klesia is a form of the Greek word kaleo, which means I call or I summon or I beckon. When you compound the two words together, ek and kaleo, they form the Greek word ekklesia, and the word ekklesia is translated church. But where was this word first used? Well, the earliest usage of the word ekklesia, translated church, was in the ancient city of Athens. And today, you can still go to Athens and you can go to the place where the first ecclesia assembled. What was the first ecclesia? What was the first church? And remember, this was not a Christian term. This was a political term in Athens, which was entirely pagan. But what did it mean? Well, in Athens, there was the ecclesia, which was a huge assembly of about 6,000 citizens. These were citizens that were especially elected in the city. Oh, can you see how Paul describes election? All of this pertains to the word church. They were elected, they were summoned forth, they were called forth, and they took their place in the ecclesia, which met on a hill right near the Acropolis. And in that location, they gathered together to hear a kerux. The word kerux is the New Testament word for a preacher. Isn't that amazing? It's where we get the word preacher. So here we have the ecclesia. They're assembled together. They're listening to the kerux who was the preacher of that particular political assembly. He was giving to them principles, facts, information that they needed to know. They had a group of ruling elders in the ecclesia, and the ecclesia as a body had the right to vote and to make very powerful decisions that affected the political climate and 
the lifestyle of Athens. They decided what would be passed, what would be prohibited. They really were the ruling voice that determined laws, determined who should be accepted, who should be banished. Whatever the ecclesia decided, that was the law of the day. This was a very powerful political body in the city of Athens. That word became the word ecclesia, used all over the New Testament, translated church. So the writers of the New Testament understood this. So when they called us the church, the word ecclesia, it was quite a message. We're not just a puny little group of believers who meet together in the hope that things will turn around. We are the ecclesia of God. We are called out from the world. We've been chosen by God, elected by him, placed in his divine assembly. We have a caterux. We have a pastor in every one of our congregations who gives us the word of God. We have ruling elders in every church. And together as a people, we are so spiritually powerful. We have the ability to decide what happens and what does not happen in our city, our state, and our nation. That's what the word church means. We're not just a group who gets together to pray and listen to the Bible. We have ruling power. All of that is in the Greek word ekklesia, which is translated the word church in the New Testament. That's who you are. That's who your church is. That's who we are. We are the church of God, called of God to make decisions that change the climate of our city, our state, and our nation. We are the church. Wow, that is so encouraging. But the verse goes on to say, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. Well, what about Philadelphia? What do we know about the city of Philadelphia? Well, we know a lot about the city of Philadelphia. I'm going to read to you from my notes. It was an eastern city on the eastern border of Asia. This is very important. You're going to find out why this is important in programs to come. It was right on the eastern border. And if you went beyond Philadelphia, then you left Asia and you entered into the rest of Asia Minor and you were on your way to Assyria because that's where the roads went. This was foreign territory. So they were right on the very eastern edge of Asia. We know that the city of Philadelphia was founded by Eumenes II in honor of his brother Attalus, whom he loved very much, and that's why he called the city Philadelphia. It's a compound of two Greek words, the word philos, which means love, the word adelphos, which is the word brother. It is love for our brother. He built this city and named this city in commemoration of his brother, whom he loved very, very much. We know that the city of Philadelphia, because of where it was, became very strategic for commerce and for trade because it was the open door to the east. If you wanted to reach the east, you had to pass through Philadelphia. And this meant Philadelphia became very important for commerce and for trade. And as a result, it became very wealthy. We know it was the open door, the open door that's very important. You're going to see this in the words of Jesus in the following verses and programs to come. It was the open door for all commerce, for all trade, for civilization, for culture to pass from Asia into Asia Minor and on to Assyria. We also know that Atlas basically designed Philadelphia, I'm sorry, Eumenes, formed Philadelphia to be like a missionary city. It was the last outpost of Greek civilization and Greek culture. Beyond that, who knows what's out there? But the people of Philadelphia believed because of where they were, because they were on the border, and because they had an open door to the east, it was their responsibility almost to behave like missionaries to take their culture and to take their civilization beyond their borders through the open door into the east where they would colonize new areas and replicate Greek culture, Greek civilization, the Greek language. So in a certain sense, they were a missionary city to take culture and language into new regions. This is also very important to what Jesus had to say to the church in Philadelphia. The city was so luxurious that Strabo, the ancient Roman historian, said it was a little Athens. It was just fabulous. In fact, the architecture there was outstanding. It had a theater. It had a beautiful downtown district. It had a huge stadium. It was simply a remarkable city. And all around the city of Philadelphia, there were vineyards. And because there were vineyards and their agriculture business was wine and grapes, 
The city was dedicated to the god Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine, the god of revelry. During Roman times, he was called Bacchus. He was often called the god of orgies. But the city was dedicated to the god Dionysus, who later became known as Bacchus. All of this is very important. Philadelphia was subject to a lot of earthquakes. This is important. It was shaken, 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 shaken by earthquakes. And in the year 17 AD, there was a massive earthquake that decimated the entire city of Philadelphia. But by that time, it had become a part of the Roman province of Asia. So the Roman emperor Tiberius gave the order for it to be rebuilt, and he provided some of the funds for its rebuilding. The rest of the funds were taken from the local citizens who were taxed in order to rebuild the city of Philadelphia. And because they were so heavily taxed, the people in Philadelphia, even though they were living in a place that mirrored Athens and had been opulent, they became rather poor because they were paying such hefty taxes to rebuild the city that had been so devastated by earthquakes. And even more, after the year 17 AD, they suffered more earthquakes for 20 years afterwards. So the city was shaking all the time. And in fact, it was so shaking with earthquakes, the people were afraid to live within the city center, so they moved outside the city. You're going to see why this is important when we come to the words of Jesus later on in Revelation chapter 3. The people would not live inside the city. They came in to do business, but they went outside the city where they lived in small homes because they were afraid if they were in the city and another earthquake came, the buildings would fall on them and they would be killed. So the people would not live inside the city because of such instability inside the city of Philadelphia. Eventually, the church in Philadelphia assumed a missionary role. Very interesting. Because of where they were, they had opportunities that other churches in Asia did not have. You need to consider where you are. If you look at where you are, you will find you will have opportunities that other places don't have. For example, we live in the city of Moscow. We have great opportunities because of where we are geographically. There are a lot of opportunities here that do not exist in villages. Well, they were living in a place of opportunity because they were living on the outpost, on the very edge, the eastern edge of Asia, and they could take the gospel into the lands to the east they literally had an open door set before them. They simply had to walk through the door. All of this is amazing. And we know that Philadelphia remained a Roman town, can you believe it, until 1379 when it was seized by the Turks. And today there is a Turkish city built on the remains of ancient Philadelphia. And there's hardly anything to see there there are the remnants of a stadium. You can see the remnants of the theater. There are city walls. And there are a few structures downtown built later in the 11th century from a cathedral, which was called the Cathedral or the Church of St. John. All of that is the history of Philadelphia. And as we proceed in these programs, you'll understand why you needed to know all of this. All of this forms a foundation for what Jesus had to say to the church in Philadelphia. Wow. But when we come back, we're going to continue in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, where Jesus goes on to say, These things saith he that is holy and true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. That's where we're going to come back in the next program. But I'll be back in just a few moments, and I'm going to pray for you. God has given all of us open doors to our destiny, but we must decide to open and walk through those doors. In Rick Renner's five-part teaching series, Christ's Message to Philadelphia, Rick explains how God has a plan for our lives and He has opened the doors needed to fulfill our destiny. All we must do is walk in God's grace and power on the path He provides. In this series, you'll learn that if you want to do something meaningful in life, you must move forward at all costs through the open doors. Available in digital or physical format starting at just $10, Rick explores this essential message of how to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit that will thrust you into the next phase of your life. 
You'll also receive Rick's book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, for free today only. The world is changing. In fact, it's more than changed. It's gone crazy. We are living in a world where faith is questioned and sin is welcome. In the book, Rick reveals the disastrous consequences of a society in spiritual and moral collapse. You'll discover what Christians need to be doing to stay out of the chaos and anchored to truth. You'll learn how to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit, discern right and wrong teaching, how to be grounded in prayer, and how to be spiritually prepared for living in victory in these last days. Don't miss this special offer, Christ's Message to Philadelphia, and or the book, How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. For free today only, call now, 1-800-742-5593, or go to renner.org to order. Wow, we covered so much material today and we're just getting started. I can hardly wait to come back tomorrow. We're going to dive deep into these verses. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series called Christ's Message to Philadelphia. It's five parts. It comes in multiple formats with a remarkable study guide. My friend, I'm telling you, I love the study guides. They are so loaded with information. We're also offering you my book today only for free called how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy, developing discernment for these last days. My friends, just because the world goes crazy does not mean you have to go crazy. You need to keep your head on straight. God wants you to think straight. We can do it, my friend. We just need to know how. And that's why I wrote this book. And it is my gift to you today for free. So contact us and we'll get it right in the mail to you. And I want to remind you again that for those who become partners with our ministry, well, what's a partner? Well, a partner is a person who financially supports our ministry. We're doing a lot around the world in addition to speaking to you by television, which is very expensive. I'm willing to do the work, but we need people to put gas in the tank so that we can take this teaching, teaching that people can trust to the ends of the earth. And when you become a partner with our ministry, you literally enter into relationship with us. You'll find out. We will pray for you. We'll call for you. We will be here for you. We will be your partner. Partnership goes two ways. And for those who become partners, we want to give you my book called Life in the Combat Zone. This book is dedicated to our partners, so I want every new partner to have it. And we also want to give you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness. The back of the book says, you hold the key to the prison door. This is a powerful book. But when you become a partner, when you send us your first gift, we'll get these in, your, in the mail to you as our first gift to initiate our relationship. And we're excited about that. But let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you that you've called us to be members of the church. We are a powerful people and we embrace that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been so good to be with you today. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power.